This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Thank you for coming today and joining us for our Earth 101 series. Jody and I share a love of science by sharing and inspiring students with all of its possibilities. Jody has been in California since I was three, contributing to the education of ecology and botany. She has won many awards and is currently focusing her energy on population and physiology of weeds and the invasion plants in her research. Jody is a very warm and supportive person and teacher. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Jody Holt. Good morning and thank you, Aurora. Okay, well I'm gonna start out with a question. How many of you are botanists? Ah, zero, that's not good. How many of you know what a botanist is? Much better, most people do. Well, a botanist, as you can see in this slide, is a person who studies plants, their structure, their function, their diversity, their identification, classification, that sort of thing. How many of you might want to be a botanist when you finish school and have to pick a career? Oh, that makes me really sad. Nobody raised your hand. Oh, well. This picture shows some of our graduate students who are botany graduate students, and what they're doing is meeting visitors to campus who may want to go to, to college and be botany majors. So they love what they do. They're studying plants, and they are trying to encourage more students to come to UCR and study plants. Well, how many of you, even if you're not a botanist or don't maybe plan to be a botanist, how many of you think plants are important in your life? Aurora, you've done a good job teaching your class. Almost everybody raised his or her hand. Well, you probably know that plants are the reason we're standing here. If it weren't for plants, we would have no food, no oxygen. Our planet would not be inhabitable by animals, including us. So what you can see in these pictures is a little bit of science about plants. Plants do the process of photosynthesis in their leaves and in all their green parts, which is how they make food which is where we get all of our food. Even if we eat something like hamburgers or chicken, those animals eat plants and that's where their food comes from. So the top picture on the right in this slide shows just a little bit of science about plants. And what you see is a picture of some leaves. And then in the middle of that top picture, there's a little blow up of a piece of a leaf. And then to the right of that, there's an even enlarged picture of a piece of that leaf showing a cell full of little green spots. And those green spots are shown in the right bottom corner of that upper slide. Those are chloroplasts, and that's where photosynthesis happens in leaves. And there are thousands of those in every leaf and lots and lots of leaves on every plant. So plants are doing a lot of photosynthesis to make their own food. If you look at the bottom picture, what you see is what we call the energy cycle on Earth, which is where all of the energy we use for our lives comes from. Now, what you might notice is that this picture isn't drawn to scale because that little chloroplast, which is microscopic, is shown bigger than the sun. And I think that's good because it shows you how important it is. So what that little cycle shows is that plant chloroplasts capture sunlight, use it to make food, carbohydrates, and that food is what all animals use to get all of their energy, plants, animals, everything else. So if there were no plants, we would not have had breakfast. We wouldn't be standing here. As you can also see on this slide, plants in this process of photosynthesis produce oxygen, which is how we're breathing. They also produce oxygen that reacts with the atmosphere and produces the ozone layer, which protects us from a lot of sunburn, a lot of UV radiation. 
So plants are the reason we're standing here. If there were no plants on Earth, life as we know it, including ourselves, would not be here. Do plants do other things? I mean, that's pretty fundamentally important. What about other things plants do in our lives? Plants make all of our food, as I've said. You might see some of your favorite foods up here in these pictures. Once you go to college at UCR, you'll discover things like coffee to keep you awake for long nights of studying. And in this picture, the lower left shows a coffee tree with coffee berries. Does anybody know what the picture on the upper left is? Cacao, I heard somebody say cacao. That's the fruit of the cacao tree, which is where chocolate comes from. Favorite food of many people. And in the other pictures, we see different fruits, vegetables. We see a picture of a wheat field. Did you know that most of the people in the world have most of their diet coming from plants in the grass family, like wheat and corn and rice and barley? Those are all grasses that feeds most people in the world. Well, are plants important for other reasons? What are you all wearing today? And what are your t-shirts made of? You're wearing clothing made of cotton. Plants provide many other things that make our lives possible and wonderful. They provide fibers like cotton. There's a picture of a cotton plant, for those of you who haven't seen one, with all these little white fibers attached to the seeds. That's where cotton comes from. You can see that plants provide building materials. The podium I'm standing in front of is made of wood, which is part of a tree. Um, there's a beautiful chair made out of wood. Plants provide for recreation. You're probably too young to be golfers yet, but I think a large fraction of you might end up being golfers. I see some smiles. You can see a putting green. That's not AstroTurf. That's a really fine textured grass. Plants provide spices, medicines. Did you know that although most of our medicines now are synthesized in laboratories, most of our medicines used to come from plants? And there were people called herb women who understood plants and used to teach doctors about how to use plants for medicine. And now most of our medicines are synthesized, but originally they came from plants. Plants provide fossil fuels and more recently biofuels. Recreation and beauty has shown in this picture. So think about when you go home how many things in your house and in your life are possible because of plants or are even made of plants. I have a coat made out of bark, which is a very, it's got a very soft fiber. I've got shoes made out of cork, which is bark. There are a lot of things you'll find in your house made of plants. Now that I've given you this introduction, we're gonna take a little test. Your students, Aurora, will like this. We're gonna have a little test. So you don't have to write anything down, but what I want you to do is to look at a few pictures, and then I'll ask you some questions, okay? So here's the first picture. Here's the second picture. And there's the third picture. Okay, the first picture, what did you see in that picture? The panda. The panda. Did you see what kind of tree he's sitting in? Bamboo. No. Bamboo, bamboo is a grass. Bamboo is not a tree. Grasses don't make wood, so it couldn't have been a bamboo tree. I'm not really sure what kind of tree it was, but it did have some leaves, some big leaves on it. It was not a grass tree. It's a regular tree with wood and leaves. Did you see bamboo in the picture? Yes. Okay, here's another question. How many of you actually saw bamboo, or how many of you, raise your hand if you just guessed it because you know that's what pandas eat? I see there are quite a few people that thought that was a good guess, and you would have gotten it right because they do eat bamboo. And you can see in this picture, if I go back to it, the leaves of the tree the panda is in, I'm really not sure what it is. They're just sort of ordinary looking leaves. But in the background, there's all bamboo, which is planted there because that is what pandas eat. But I think you mostly noticed the panda, right? And you were smart enough to know there should be bamboo in that enclosure. Oops. What did you see in the second picture? Armadillo. Armadillo. How many have ever seen one alive? I grew up in the South and they're hard to see. They're kind of secretive. Sometimes they get run over. It's hard to see one alive. You're lucky if you have. Did you see any plants in that picture? Yes. A palm. What kind of palm? Don't really know. Well, the palm in that picture was actually not a tree because the stem of that palm is kind of wimpy and it lays along the ground. But you recognize the palm leaves. It's called a palmetto. That was a good recognition. What else did you see in that picture? 
grass. So you did well on that picture. So there's an armadillo running away because they're very shy and there's some palmettos in the back. You can see their little stems and big leaves and some grass. What about the third picture? Bald eagles. You know why they're important to us? They're a symbol for the United States. Excellent. So what kind of tree were they in? A dead tree. You are very observant, more so than many of the adults that watch my presentation. Did you see any flowers in that picture? Yes. Where were they? There was a tree on the sort of lower left part of the picture that had flowers. Did anybody see any pink flowers? Yes, a couple of people saw those. There were a couple of pink flowers in there. And before I show you the picture again, did you see any conifers? Does anybody know what a conifer is? It's a kind of a tree with needle or scale leaves like some people use for Christmas trees or junipers, things like that. Do you see any of those? Aha, yeah. uh -huh, you're not sure. So here are the bald eagles in a dead tree, which you noticed. To the left are trees with flowers, the small white flowers. And the color may not be very well um, resolved here, but there are a couple of pink flowers sort of down in the lower left part of the picture. And then up on the upper right, you can see the needle leaves of a conifer. So you did pretty well in these pictures. You really did, except maybe the bamboo part. Everybody was really enchanted with the panda, right? Well, I think you get a pretty good grade on this, but I think most of you might be afflicted with what's shown on this picture, something called plant blindness to some extent. Most people are. Have you ever heard of this phrase? Yes. You have. Well, most people have it. I'm glad a few of you have. Plant blindness is a phrase that was developed by some scientists and they work at Louisiana State University and their laboratory is called the 15 degree laboratory as you can see in this picture and plant blindness is what they called the inability of most people to actually see plants that are in our environment and they are botanists and educators and they were concerned about this and they wanted to find out perhaps why this is so because a lot of us have observed that people tend to overlook or not notice plants. And what these scientists discovered was something that was pretty startling. And that is most people don't overlook or ignore plants because they just don't like them or think they're not interesting. It's because the way our eyes work, we just aren't able to see plants very readily unless we're thinking about it and make an effort to. There's some numbers on this slide that represent something about the way our visual system works. The first number, 10 times 10 to the 6, is 10 million. What that is, is the number of bits of information that pass by your eyes every second when you're out and about in the world. You all have computers, you've heard of a bit. 10 million bits is a lot of data. Every second when you're out and about, 10 million bits of data pass before your eyes. How many bits of data do you think your brain can actually perceive? I put the numbers there so I wouldn't have to memorize them. 40. Not 40,000, not 40 million, but 40. And how many bits of data do you think your brain actually processes? 16. 16. Good. You can read that slide. From 10 million to 16. So although our eyes see, with quotation marks, what's in front of us, we don't really see and absorb and process very much of it. So what is it you're going to actually see and your brain will process when you walk around? Think of the pictures we just saw. Things that are warm and fuzzy and cute. Things that are colorful and that have a contrast to their background. Uh, maybe things that are threatening. Things that are rare you haven't seen before. Um, things that look like us. It's been shown that babies really react to faces before anything else. And we react to animals that have faces that, are, that look like us in some ways. You might look at things that are threatening. So where are plants in our environment? They're often just in the background and they're often mostly green with not as much contrast. So we don't, t <coughs> excuse me, we don't tend to notice them quite as readily as we do other things. And in fact, the reason these scientists call their laboratory the 15 degree laboratory is that they also observe that most people spend most of their time looking at things at eye level and 15 degrees below, rather than looking down at the ground, which also cuts out a lot of plants that are growing on the ground that are shorter than we are. 
So it's no wonder we really don't notice plants very much unless we have a botanist to show us how wonderful and amazing plants are and how fundamentally important they are to our lives. And that's why I'm here today, okay? So what I'm gonna talk about next is this movie, Avatar. And how many of you have seen Avatar? How many have seen it several times? How many have seen it more than I have? A few people still have your hands up. I'm glad you did because there's several reasons this movie was really, really important. Many people say the reason it was important is that it's the highest grossing movie of all time. It has made over $2 billion, not counting all the products that came out after the movie. The other thing that makes it really important, I'm sure you've noticed, is that the technology for this movie was new and it really revolutionized how motion capture and 3D movies are made. So since Avatar came out, nearly every movie that you see in the theaters has a 3D version, right? It really changed the landscape for movie making from now on. But there's a third reason that I think this is one of the most important movies of all time. And why might you think that I would think this movie is important? Yes. There are a lot of plants. And I think this movie really cured a lot of people of plant blindness for a long time. So here's a scene from the movie where you can right away see these magnificent giant trees that you couldn't help but notice in the movie. They're beautiful. This looks like a real location and the trees are just giant. It's a beautiful scene. But the scene shown here is the one that I really think made a difference to the audience in terms of their own plant blindness. In this scene, you might remember that Jake was walking with a flame to light, light his way, and Natiri came and put the flame out and fussed at him. And as soon as that happened, all the plants in the background started to glow with bioluminescence. And the first time people see that, you can hear the audience sort of gasp the way Jake did because they suddenly notice that there are plants in their environment that they hadn't seen before, okay? Well, in 2007, I was really lucky enough to receive a phone call from John Landau, the producer's office, and he was looking for a botanist to consult on the movie. And it turns out that the leading lady in this movie was Sigourney Weaver, and she was gonna play a botanist in the lead role. And so what they were looking for was somebody who could consult with her about how to be a botanist, how a botanist would dress and act, sample plants, what kind of equipment she would carry. And I was really happy to say yes and accept that position and get to work on this movie. So I spent a summer consulting with Sigourney Weaver and the set designers on the equipment, um, her clothing, and just sort of how she acts like a botanist in the movie. And another thing that they asked me to do at the end of that was even more important to me. And that is, I was asked to think about the storyline and how we might explain what you see in the movie, which is the communication that occurs between the plants and the animals and all the people. And that was a really obvious thing that enchanted a lot of people. But when I was asked about it, I thought, you know, we ought to really put some real science in this movie. And it occurred to me that this phrase you see in the slide, signal transduction, might be the perfect way to explain what's going on in the movie. Plants don't have a nervous system. Plants can't communicate the way we do. But signal transduction is a brand new area of science that's just the most cutting edge area of research going on. It was really pioneered at UC Riverside. And what this describes is how cells communicate very rapidly across a plant body or an organism. So what a great way to suggest that maybe this is what's going on in the movie. We don't know that it's not. We don't know that it is. 50 years from now, we'll know a lot more about it and I think it'll be a really good explanation. So in the scene you see here, Grace and Norm as their avatars are talking about how plants communicate and she says, we call it signal transduction. If you were a scientist like me and you heard that, that made you very excited to see in the movie. And a lot of people have contacted me and said they thought that was just fabulous because they know there's real science in this movie to explain what's going on. So getting real science into a science fiction movie was a really special part of what I got to do. Well, after that, after the production, I got another call and asked me to be a part of another project, which was, as a botanist, something that was really even more exciting to me. I was asked to write a little book of the botany of Pandora, where the movie took place. 
So what I was asked to do was to take images like what you see in this slide of the plants that were created by the artist for the movie and think about what they might be and write an explanation for what they are and why they look the way they do. Now as a botany teacher, this is what I have my students do all the time. I'll show them a plant and say, why do you think it looks this way? And the answer is dependent on understanding the environment those plants are growing in. Because as you know, plants can't get up and leave when they're uncomfortable or hot or dry. They're rooted right where they're growing. And so plants, the way they look is largely a function of the environment that selected their adaptations to survive there. So if you understand the environment, you can explain the plants. Well, right about that time I was asked to talk to a group of students like you and explain how I did my writing. And I thought that was really hard to explain. Well, right about that time, I went to visit my sister and I went out to dinner with my nephew, William, who's shown in this picture. And we went to the California Pizza Kitchen, his favorite. And at dinner, he said what some of you might be thinking, which is, Aunt Jody, how did you make up all that botany about those wacky plants? So I said, William, why don't you take this little napkin shown in the picture and draw the wackiest plant you can come up with. And when you're done, we'll together figure out what it might be and figure out what we might call it. So he started to draw and he came up with this picture that you see on the napkin. And I'm afraid right at that point I interrupted him because I said, I know how to explain this plant because there is a real plant that looks almost like that. Has anybody ever seen this plant? In pictures or in real? Pictures. pictures, yeah, I haven't seen a real one either. People have seen pictures. This plant is called Rafflesia, and it grows in Borneo in a rainforest in Indonesia. This is a real plant and it produces the world's largest flower, which can be three or four feet across. It's enormous. Well, this plant, the reason you don't see anything green is that the plant lives below ground inside the roots of other plants. And the only time it comes above ground is when it flowers. This giant flower opens. It stinks terribly, which is because it's pollinated by something that likes stinky things. So beetles and things that like stinky things will pollinate it. Once the seeds are pollinated, the flower dries up, goes away, and you don't see anything else till it flowers again. Now, how wacky is that? So if I wrote about that, a science fiction movie writer would think, I am some sort of a genius, but I am not, I'm just a botanist. This is a real plant. So this is how I decided to describe the plants in the movie. I decided that everybody needs a little bit of a botany lesson, so we would just do as much real botany as we could. Now here's another plant that was in the movie that I think most of you probably remember. Does anybody remember what this plant did in the movie when it was touched? What did it do? What did it do? If you get close to it and touch it, it folds up and then it snaps below ground, right? Everybody remembers that. Do real plants do that? How would you explain this? Does anybody know of plants that can move? Well, actually, look at this picture. This is a Venus flytrap. You're probably familiar with that. Now, it's moving. It's not getting up and walking away, but it's moving. What's more, do you know what that's called? That process is called. The real name for that process in botany is Figmonasty. I didn't have to make that up. The movie people thought that was great. And I described how it works in real plants, only on a grand scale, because this helichoridion is a giant plant. And it was a perfect explanation. I didn't have to make anything up. Even though the plant was drawn by an artist and it's not real, the way it functions and behaves is just like real plants on Earth. There are a few plants that can move like that. What about this? Did anybody see plants like this in the movie? What does it make you think of? Kind of looks like a water pitcher or something, doesn't it? Well, there are a lot of plants on Earth that have very modified leaves that look like pitchers. Does anybody know what this plant on the right is? Oh, you need to see some of these. This is a carnivorous plant. Do you know what that means? It means a plant, what does it mean? It eats meat. Well, it's a plant that can digest insects to get its nutrition. Now, that plant is still green. It's doing its own photosynthesis. But carnivorous plants like this live in waterlogged, boggy areas where what you would think of as the fertilizers, the nitrogen, things in the soil, leach away. And plants do need some vitamins and minerals like we do. So these plants have evolved in wet, boggy areas 
and they've adapted to that area by being able to trap, capture, and digest insects just the way your stomachs would if you ate insects. So this leaf is highly modified. If you look down inside of it, you'll see hairs that point down. So a poor little insect climbs down in there. He can't climb back out because the hairs point down. Rainwater collects in the bottom. The insects eventually fall in and drown. And there are digestive enzymes, just like in my growly stomach, that will digest that insect. And the plant is then able to get its nitrogen from an insect and basically eat a bug instead of getting it from the soil. That, a lot of you had never heard of that. And so that was a perfect explanation for these plants in the movie that looked like carnivorous plants. They were just 10 feet tall, so I just wrote about how they would digest a person if he fell in. But the process is just the same. What about this plant? What does this make you think of? Yes, what does it make you think of? Pineapple. Looks a bit like a giant pineapple, but what you can see here is this plant is one of the few that was made into a model for a live action scene. And on the scale that it is, it almost is tree size. What do you notice about all those things that stick off of it that look like they might be leaves? They're kind of fat and fleshy and what we call succulent. Have you ever seen a plant like that? You should visit our botanic garden at UC Riverside because look at this picture taken there. This is a succulent plant taken at the botanic garden. This is the type of plant that grows really well in a desert and a dry area like Southern California. The reason those leaves are fat and fleshy is that they've adapted the ability to store up water. So if you were walking around in the desert and you were dry and hot and you didn't have any water, you could grab one of those leaves and bite into it and there'd be a lot of water in it. So it was really easy to write about these plants because they look like a lot of our desert plants and they store up water because either the soil is dry or maybe the water in the soil is not available to them because it contains a toxin or something. So again, a lot of real botany went into describing these plants that were created by graphic artists that aren't botanists at all. Here's another plant in the movie, which is one of the ones that glowed in the dark with a process called bioluminescence. Well, do you think plants on Earth bioluminesce? Not yet. We don't know of any plants that have this ability, but there are plants like this one that are as beautiful in color and size as that one in the previous picture that bioluminesces. Bioluminescence right now is known in deep sea creatures that live in deep in the depths of the ocean and they basically glow in the dark by emitting radiation as a signaling device. So it was very easy to write about how plants might do that, although this is the one thing that plants on Earth that we don't know that they do. So that was a little bit transferred from animals to plants. So here's a scene in the movie that just shows the way the landscape looked with the floating mountains and some sort of normal looking plants and some pretty bizarre looking plants off in the distance. Well, here's a scene that wasn't taken in the movie. This was taken in a rainforest in Washington State that looks a lot like where the live action scenes were filmed in Avatar. It, a lot of it was filmed and inspired by a rainforest. Well, this is in Washington, right here on the West Coast, and it was just coincidental that we're wearing blue rainwear because we kind of look like Navi, don't you think, or avatars? And the reason I'm showing this is I want you to realize that it doesn't take an artist or a science fiction writer to make up the most interesting and extreme and exotic plants that you can imagine. They're right here on Earth. And here is a picture of two really beautiful carnivorous plants, the type that digest, trap and digest insects. The picture on the left is actually a plant that is native to California. Right around the Northern California, Southern Oregon border, there are wet, boggy areas with lots and lots of these plants growing. And they can get up to be one or two feet tall. They're beautiful, really wonderful to see. And on the right, you see another carnivorous plant with a very different looking pitcher that traps insects. In fact, there are some carnivorous plants in the tropics, not in the United States, that are, the trap leaves are so big, they can trap small rodents like mice and rats and small rabbits. That's how big they are. Those would go really well in Avatar. Here's a picture of plants adapted to grow in the desert with all kinds of really strange modifications that allow them to store water, like the ones with the big fat stems, or protect themselves from somebody that might want to eat the plant, like the cactus with the big spines. And the plant on the lower right is one of my very favorites. This grows in Africa in the driest deserts in the world. 
it looks like a big trash pile, doesn't it, where somebody's dumped their old dead plants. This plant is actually related to a pine tree. It makes little cones. The little things poking up on the top are little bitty cones on little stems. It has a very short tree trunk. And that pile of stuff that looks like green trash is the two leaves this plant grows for its entire life. And they just grow and grow and grow and get really, really long. But in this environment, the wind and the sand blow and just tear it up terribly. Same way if you hang a flag outside your car window for your favorite team and it blows in the wind and pretty soon it's just a rag. This plant just looks like a rag, but it is just growing and growing and growing and growing. Pretty exotic. You can't make something like that up. You really can't. And then here's the plant that I showed you previously with a beautiful burgundy color. This plant makes the largest inflorescence in the world. And an inflorescence is nothing but a big stalk full of many flowers. You can see in the background, there's some students visiting this plant in the Huntington Gardens. They're about your age, about your size. This plant, when it finishes flowering and opening, can be taller than I am. And I'm a normal sized person, so it can be over five feet tall. On the right, you see a picture of the one leaf each plant has, which is about the size of a party umbrella on your patio. So this is a pretty extreme plant, and it's just beautiful. Here's another extreme plant I like to show people to impress them with how magnificent plants can be. This plant makes the largest leaf in the world. It looks like a water lily, and in fact it is. It's a water lily. Does anybody ever, has anybody ever seen anything like this? Where did you see one? Pictures of it. This is shown in a lot of botany books. In real life, the plant actually grows in the Amazon River in South America, floating in the river. So if you look up giant water lily, Amazon, you'll find lots of pictures of it. This little baby on the upper right is perfectly safe from all the anacondas and piranhas in the Amazon. He's sitting on a leaf in Kew Gardens in England inside of a glass house, but it gives you a sense of scale and how giant this leaf is. This is a leaf that has really different adaptations because it floats on water. So if you pulled it out and compared it to a leaf from a desert plant, they would be entirely different because of the different environments where they grew. Well, where did all this botany end up? What's really exciting to me is that all the botany I wrote about the plants on Avatar, on Pandora in the movie Avatar, ended up in a place where you might actually see it. There are video games of the movie, and if you play those games as an explorer, you can find a lot of science and a lot of information about the plants and animals in those games. There's also a little book that accompanies the games, and while I am not selling these products or promoting them, the point here is that there's a lot of real science that accompanies this movie, and by being in this form, it has been able to expose a lot of people to a lot of botany that they otherwise might not have found out about. There's another thing that makes this movie really wonderful for me, and I'll, maybe it will be a little bit of information that might make you consider being a botanist when you get older and finish school. There's now a botany action figure. Don't you want a career where there's an action figure for your career? I think she looks a little like me, don't you think? She's Grace in her little action figure clothing is walking around in the forest. Well, I bought one of these action figures and in fact, she's no bigger than my index finger. But still, it's exciting to have a botany action figure. Then I discovered there is actually a second botany action figure because botanists are sort of underappreciated the way plants are. There's another action figure called Treetop Barbie. Has anybody ever seen one of these? Have you ever heard of a treetop botanist? This is another really interesting extreme subject. There are trees in the world that are so tall that they have their own ecosystems in the top of plants and animals and insects that never come to Earth. They only live in the tops of these trees. And the only way to see them is to be a treetop botanist and go to the top of the tree and study them. So if you think botanists are underappreciated, what about somebody that spends every working day in the top of a big tree? You never even see them. So the people in this forest canopy lab developed a contract with Mattel to make a treetop Barbie. And if you make a donation to their research program, you can have a treetop Barbie. And that was one way they came up with a very creative way to promote their work and make people aware of what they do. 
Well, at the end of all these projects in late 2009, my husband and I were lucky enough to be invited to go to the cast and crew screening of Avatar and the party that happened afterwards. So we got to go see the movie at the Grauman's Chinese Theater, which is a wonderful place to go. I had never been there. And what was really fun about seeing the movie there for the first time was that everybody in the audience was a part of Team Avatar. We all had our names in the credits, and during the credits, everybody was cheering and pointing to their name. So it was a really fun opportunity to be a part of a team that was really bringing a fabulous movie and a lot of science to audiences all over the world. So what I wanna conclude with is to remind you that plants are responsible for life on Earth as we know it. They're the reason we're standing here breathing and soon to go eat lunch. And if you're not aware of plants, if you're plant blind, it would never occur to you that plants are important and need to be conserved. And so by being aware of plants, hopefully it will make you realize that one of the things that's happening with human development and human population growth on Earth is that many habitats for animals, including many plants, are being destroyed by human activity and conservation of plants is really, really important. And then I think hopefully the movie has shown you as I've shown through this presentation that the Hollywood media is a great way to show a lot of people about plants and to send a message that science is important in ways that as a teacher I'm really unable to reach them. This movie reached millions of people, so I think it's been a really great story and a great way to make a lot of impact on the public about botany. In fact, there are a lot of people in Hollywood that like this movie. And thank you for your attention and for participating, and now we'll be able to take some questions from you. Is there any other plants besides the poison ivy that are dangerous to humans? So the question is, are there other plants besides poison ivy that are dangerous? Yes, there are. There are a lot of wild plants that are very poisonous, and if you ate them, you would get very sick and maybe even die. And what's interesting is there are a lot of plants that we eat as food that the wild relatives of are very dangerous and toxic, which is really interesting. Ever since the beginning of agriculture, farmers and now scientists have been selecting plants and making crosses and trying to develop plants through just cross-pollination that have traits that we like. And one thing they've done is to try to breed out some of the toxins or poisons that are in plants. So what you might not know is that the plant family that contains potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, and some other wild plants is a plant family that contains a lot of poisonous plants. The plants we eat now, the tomatoes and peppers and um, potatoes, those are not poisonous, but a lot of their wild relatives are. Can you think of why plants might have poisons in them? Um, so that animals don't eat them? Exactly. Plants are not trying to discourage people, but Plants, as we talked about earlier, are rooted in the ground and they can't get up and leave. So if an animal or an insect comes up to take a bite out of a plant, that plant is sort of stuck there. So many plants have evolved over many millions of years, um, poisons or spines or thorns or like poison oak that was asked about, little hairs on their surfaces that have little glands with something that makes you itchy and sting. And animals can learn pretty quickly to stay away from those plants and not eat them. And so plants have these defense mechanisms that affect people just like they affect insects and animals, which is probably what they originally came for, okay? How many years has, does it take to become a botanist? So how many years? I used to tell students when I was in graduate school that I was in grade 22, but then they had a really bad reaction. They'd sort of gag like, ooh. So you can be a botanist now, actually. There are a lot of people that love plants and visit gardens and do a lot of things on their own as sort of amateur botanists. To be a botanist like I am as a university professor, I went to college, and actually I didn't become a botany major until very, the very end of college, I was a math major. But then I took botany just for fun and I loved it. So then I went to graduate school and got a master's and a PhD in botany, and that took six years after college so after high school, that was about 10 years. 
many people after getting a PhD in a field like botany or zoology will then work for a couple of years getting research experience and then start a permanent job. But there are many jobs as a botanist for somebody with a college degree, with a master's, with a PhD, lots and lots of jobs that have to do with plants. And for example, my job, I teach botany and I know a lot about botany. I learn, I do research on botany, but one of my major hobbies is horticulture, which is growing plants. So I have a garden and I have vegetables. So if you discover that you love plants, you can do a lot of things with plants even well before you finished your education and become a professional botanist like me. Okay. Now, how you just recently stated that some plants have furs with glands. Now, is grass that you would see in our backyards and front yards at our homes one of those plants that have that? You know, there are a lot of people that are allergic to grass. And in that case, it's not because of gland, glandular hairs on the outside that have the toxin on them. Poison oak and stinging nettle, which is another one you might see around here, you can actually see on the plant little hairs on the surface. So when you just touch the plant, that material in those glands gets on you and it causes a rash and it's itchy. A lot of people have allergic reactions to grass um, because of some other um, organic molecule in the grass. A lot of people are actually allergic to pollen in flowering plants and some grasses and other plants like ragweed, pine trees. A lot of plants produce lots and lots and lots of pollen that blows around in the wind and because it has a lot of protein in it, people can be allergic to that. So there are different parts of plants that you can have an allergy to and it kind of differs depending on which plant it is. But it's okay to roll around in the grass. You won't get the same effect that you get from poison oak or stinging nettle. Although some people do get a little itchy when they roll in the grass. So you have to be careful and maybe do a little test with your arm before you go rolling down a big hill of grass. Okay. Why do weeds go faster than any other plants that we plant? That's a really good question. Does everybody know what a weed is? Yes. How would you define a weed? Most people define a weed as a plant out of place or a plant growing where you don't want it. So if I'm growing a garden and I'm planting peas and lettuce, but tomatoes pop up from my last garden, that tomato would be my weed because that's not what I want to grow there at that time. So the question has to do with why do we observe that weeds tend to grow faster than everything else? That's more of a biological question. And the reason that is the case is that plants that we most often see being weedy, meaning popping up where we didn't plant them and invading new areas and coming into areas that are disturbed, those plants already have certain characteristics that make them very hardy, like pioneer plants, colonizer plants. They can come into an area and grow fast, produce flowers and seeds very quickly, and populate an area before other plants can. So we don't usually see things like trees being weedy. We usually see plants that are herbaceous, meaning soft, fast growing, that are able to spread really quickly, like the grass in your lawn that makes these stems that spread out, or dandelions that make lots of seeds. Plants like that are the ones that are most often weedy because they have these traits that causes them to be really good at colonizing new areas. And a lot of plants have actually adapted to human activity and have become worse weeds because of their association with humans. So has anybody ever noticed in your lawns that when you have dandelions, the flowers, the yellow flower or inflorescence, because it's really a cluster of flowers, is very close to the ground, right about the level of the grass. And if you're asked to mow the lawn, you usually cut over the top and it doesn't cut the flower, the inflorescence is off because their stems are very short. And the plants that have evolved to be the most successful in our lawns are the ones with really short stems, so the lawnmower skips them. That's a form of selection. Humans have selected low-growing dandelions. Well, when do those stems pop up? You see the stems getting long when the seeds are ready and they're already, the flowers are open and those seeds have that little puff of hair called a pappus. And that's when you go, oh no, and you try to grab it and then they blow away and they get all over your lawn and a new dandelion comes up everywhere one of those seed lands. That plant is really adapted to human activity. They've develop the ability to stay short and not get cut off until the seeds are ready. 
when the seeds are ready to be dispersed and spread and grow a new plant, within an hour those stems pop up and the seeds go away and it's too late to catch them. So that's a really good weed. It's really learned to deal with how humans want to want to get rid of it. What inspired you to take an interest in botany? You know, it's easier to answer the question of what inspired me to be a botanist now than it was when I did it. And when I look back, I realize that ever since I was little, I loved being outdoors, camping, hiking, playing in the dirt, playing with plants. But when I was in college, I was really interested in math. I had a math teacher in about 10th grade in high school, and I just wanted to be like that teacher. She was good in math, everybody liked her, and I thought I could be a mathematician and have a normal life and be popular too. I loved math. And in college, I took all the biology courses and all the courses that pre-med students did, but I was a math major. And towards the end of my junior year, I decided that I didn't want to be a math teacher. I didn't know what I would do for a job. So I just took a botany class for fun. Somebody recommended it, took it for fun. It was just a chance. And the very first week of the class, we looked through a microscope. And what we looked at is the tips of onion roots and we watched cells dividing. And I was just completely enchanted and I went right up to my advisor and changed my major that day. And then I had to take all the botany courses in a short amount of time so I could graduate with a degree in botany. But once my eyes were opened, and I think looking through that microscope made me no longer plant blind, it, I couldn't get enough botany and I took botany classes until I graduated and then I thought, well, I don't know enough botany so I went to graduate school. So it really has to do with a lot of chance and having a really great teacher that inspired me, but also being willing to open your eyes to any opportunities. Coming today, this is a great opportunity to learn something new. What you're gonna decide to do when you finish school is in a lot of ways gonna be um, decided upon by your eliminating things you don't like. So if you take a class or do a project and think, oh, I don't wanna ever do that again, that's great because you've taken that off your list because there's so many opportunities of things you can do. What you have to be sure and do is just be open to all those opportunities so that everything gets absorbed and you have many things to choose from and then you'll start picking out things you like more than others. And sometimes I wonder how it is that I ended up here when so many of my choices about what to do seemed like they were just sort of, oh, I like that, I'll do that. Oh, I like this, I'll do this. They seem kind of random. But when I look back on it, I can see that I always love being outdoors and I always love plants and there is a common theme, but I didn't recognize it at the time. So it takes some being very open to opportunities and sort of reflecting on what it is you're thinking and experiencing and what you like and what you don't like. And it's not too early to start doing that. Okay. Did you name the plants in Avatar? And if so, how did you name them? That's a great question. When I was given the book of images of plants, they had what we call common names, like Helichoridion and uh, Banshee, and some names that the artists that drew them just made up. And they also had Natvi names, which are names in the Natvi language that they would have called the plants. So they had human common names and the Natvi common names. But in Biology, you may know that every organism has a scientific name or a Latin name, which consists of the genus and species, so two Latin words joined together, and every organism has a unique Latin name. So the dandelion that we talked about is Taraxacum officinale. The genus is Taraxacum, and the species is Taraxacum officinale. So there are many species of Taraxacum. So there's a real process for how these plants get their names, and there's an international governing board of biologists that approve names for plants. So there is a process for giving a plant a name, and of course I didn't have to really use that because this was a science fiction movie, but there's certain rules about how Latin words are used to give names. So the genus name, the first Latin word, usually describes something about the plant or the discoverer or the location where it grows, and then the specific second word, the specific epithet, the species, is a descriptor, like maybe it's color or something like that. And so I looked up the rules and I learned a little bit about Latin and how to make the words agree, and then I just gave them all Latin names the way a botanist would. 
which was really, really fun because I could pretend like I was Grace on Pandora and had discovered a plant and I could look at it and think, what does this look like? So the names I gave were things like um, the plant that I showed you that looks like a big um, fan that was bioluminescent. I gave it a name in Latin that means feathery and then the second word means the colors it has. So the Latin name is actually very meaningful in helping describe the plant. A lot of people ask me, well, why didn't you name the plants after you? Because people who discover plants often will name them after themselves. And I felt like that really wasn't appropriate for the movie, although it would have been fun. And in that case, I would have maybe named a plant something like Terexicum jodii, which is the Latin way to give my name on a plant. But I didn't do that. But that was a really fun process too, because as a botanist, discovering plants, naming plants, describing plants, that's really what I love to do. So it was really fun to do it. My question is on the topic of weeds. Is it possible for any plant to be a weed? Is it possible for any plant to be a weed? The first definition I gave you, a plant out of place, suggests that any plant can be a weed at any time if the person who is using that piece of land for something doesn't want that plant there. So yes, it really could be. For example, when we bought our home, the yard hadn't been taken care of for a long time. And there were some trees in really odd places. And the reason they were there, I think, is that a bird had maybe eaten the fruit off of a tree and then flown over and dropped the seeds and they grew in the lawn. So we had a really strange little tree right in the middle of the lawn that nobody would have probably planted there. That was a weed to me and we had it taken out. Now that's using the sort of human anthropomorphic definition, meaning giving a human characteristic a plant out of place. If you define a weed biologically as a plant that's a fast growing, fast reproducing sort of pioneer species, then not all plants have those traits. So if you think about the giant redwood, the giant sequoia trees in California, have you any of you seen those? Largest trees in the world. They're <coughs> as big as a house. Those plants spend a lot of their energy growing big and protecting themselves with defenses and making a lot of bark. They don't grow fast, they don't reproduce fast. Nobody would ever consider them a weed anywhere, I suspect. And they don't have the biological traits that make them weedy either, okay? But if, if your lawn has a plant pop up in it that you didn't want there and your mom says, go pull that out, that's a weed to you. It could be a rose bush, but that's a weed to you, okay? Um. Is it possible for a plant to grow back in the same place even after you pull it out? Yes, so it depends on the kind of plant. Um, he wanted to know if plants would grow back when you pull them out. Plants are of several different types. An annual plant is one that grows from a seed, flowers, produces more seeds, and then dies within a year. A perennial plant is one that can keep growing and growing and growing, like your lawn. It doesn't die every year. It keeps growing. And the reason it does is that it has stems and roots below ground with buds on them that can make new stems and roots. So if you go out in your lawn and pull up a chunk of lawn, the rest of it that you didn't pull out will keep growing. And a plant like a dandelion is a perennial plant that can live year after year. And what happens with it is if you pull it out but you break off the top and you don't get everything that was bl growing below ground, you will probably leave some below ground stems with buds and they will grow new plants. So a lot of plants actually have more than roots below ground. They have pieces of stem below ground with buds on them that can grow. So I'll give you another example. Does anybody know what a potato is? What is a potato? Botanically speaking, it's a stem. It's a very fat, enlarged stem. Have you ever noticed on a potato it has things on it we call eyes, little dots? Those are buds. In my botany class right now, I showed them a potato and I said, this is a stem, it has buds on it, which are little areas that'll grow new plants. We put it in the window of the class because that potato will not only sprout shoots on it and make new plants, it will turn green. And sure enough, the potato in the window of my classroom has little stems growing off of each of those little buds and the whole outside of it has turned green. So if you have a potato plant growing in the ground and you yank it out, you're probably gonna leave some of those potatoes that are attached to the stems below ground and each one of those will grow a new plant. 
So there's a lot more below ground than above ground for some plants. So you're not just walking on soil, you're walking on the rest of the plant that is below the ground. So. What courses in college did you have to take to become a botanist? The courses in college, that's really interesting. You know, as a botanist, I'm a biologist, so I study living organisms. And in order to be a biologist specializing in botany, you have to take the same courses that any biologist would take. So in college, for example, at UCR, you would take a year of courses in biology, physics, chemistry, organic chemistry, mathematics, and then you would start to take courses in botany or entomology if you like insects or zoology if you like animals or human anatomy and things like that if you liked studying humans and maybe wanted to be a doctor. But all the biology students take the same first two years of courses in biology, chemistry, physics, math, um, organic chemistry, a little bit of genetics, things like that. And that's sort of the core of a biologist knowledge. And then from there you specialize, and I specialized in plants. Okay. And some of those things you take in high school too, but it's um, you know, more of it when you get to college. So. Now you talked about um, studying plants on land, but do botanists study plants underwater as well? Absolutely, botanists study plants wherever they grow. In fact, after my name appeared in the credits of Avatar, I had several people call me and say, we want to study astrobotany, plants in space. And I said, well, I don't know of any plants in space. I don't know of anybody that does that. But there are plants that live in water. Some of the plants that live in water are um, plants as we know them that have special adaptations, like the water lily that floats in water or they might be rooted below the water. So they're plants that study aquatic, they're botanists that study aquatic plants like that. In the oceans, there are a lot of <coughs> organisms that seem like plants that are... From the, in the ocean, because I caught it. Okay. <laughs> We're doing great. It's just... So in the oceans, there are a lot of organisms that are like plants. Some people call them plants. But they're not really plants like the plants on Earth, but the seaweeds. Have any of you been to the coast, um, generally further north than Southern California, and seen the giant seaweeds laying all over the, the beach? They're greens and browns and oranges, and they're huge. And you can see them if you go to the, one of the aquariums around here, too. They kind of look like plants. They're very simple organisms, and they don't really have all the features of plants on Earth. But botanists study those, too. So anything basically that does photosynthesis and that is at all plant-like is studied by botanists. And the seaweeds are really one of the most interesting groups of organisms anywhere.